Hey church, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and talk to you about uh, June the 7th, when we finally get to come back together. And I've mentioned to you this already, I, we've sent the information out it's been on Facebook and, and that kind of thing, but I want to just kind of bring it to your attention that we're going to actually be having two services. We're going to have an 845 service and a 1045 service, but specifically the 845 service is going to be uh, exclusive. It's going to be for people who are 65 and older and their family members, family members that they have been they have been spending close quarters time with, not extended, um, and also those who might have health compromised um, systems. Okay, things that are going on where they they need to be cautious. That's what that that service is supposed to be for. So make sure that you are aware of that. And, and I don't we don't want to turn somebody away that comes for that service and then and didn't know. So uh, make sure that you're aware of that. And uh, that'll give us a good hour in between the services to make sure we sanitize and everything like that. So uh, you can get some time to go out and maybe talk in the parking lot, six feet distance. Uh, I know it's been a long time since you got to say hello. So uh, it's, it's okay to do that, but we're gonna to try to make a five minute transition. We're gonna make it as smooth as we possibly can. We'll have someone that's gonna, gonna bring you in and take you and get you seated. And then also when you leave, we'll do that in a worthy fashion as well. Um, this, both of these services are going to be in the Ball Family Life Center, and you'll have two, two exits, two entrances to be able to come in and out of. Uh, but once you're seated, we'd like for you to stay there, um, so there'll be that much less to worry about unless you need to go to the restroom, which is completely fine. Um, so I think that's about all I've got to tell you, except for the fact that I really miss you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all. And uh, so June the 7th, make sure you mark your calendars. We finally get to come back together. And I'm really excited about it. We'll see you soon.
Welcome, Huntington First Church of the Nazarene. And those who weren't Huntington First Church of the Nazarene, we're glad to have you this morning. I'm glad that you joined us here on Facebook. Uh, glad that you joined us. Maybe you're watching on hfcnaz.com or our new YouTube channel. Uh, either way, we're really glad that you're here. Um, many of you know that I am, a, many of you in the church know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Corvette fan. I, I, I like a Corvette. It's my, muscle, it's my muscle car of choice. I like the Corvette because they're unique. They're unique to lots and lots of other cars because in 1953, uh, they were made with an all fiberglass body. And I just think it's cool. Um, the picture that you're looking at right now is going to be a 1967. Um, they, they put out a Corvette in 1967. It happens to be the year that I was born. They put out a, a 427 V8 engine in this Corvette. Um, it's called the LA8. It, uh, on, on the books, it said that it had 430 horsepower, but actually it was closer to a whopping 560 horsepower, and they only made 20 of them. This is really, really cool stuff uh, for some of you. But in about four years ago, excuse me, about six years ago in 2014, um, they had a, an auction, and they auctioned off one of these very rare 20 of these cars. They, they auctioned one of these L88s off. And it sold at auction. Would you like to hear how much it sold for? A whopping $3,850,000 for one car. And it was a, it was a one, of, one of a kind. It was red on red. It was the only one of the 20 like that. But that's pretty amazing. I don't know. Probably my love of Corvettes came from... Uh, my father, he had a 1972 black convertible Stingray. Um, it's probably where I fell in love with him. You're probably looking at a picture right now of my father and my older sister, Robin, standing beside that, that Stingray. And uh, me and my father got to take a trip across the country in that one time. And it's just been really, really special to me. So I have always loved the mid-70s up to 1982. Uh, and then Chevy decided to skip 1983. So they put out in 1984 what I like to refer to as this, this, the ugly rear end, flared fenders gone, what in the world were the designers thinking stage? Because it's a lot of years that I didn't really care for the body style. So I know that probably a lot of you at this moment are getting a little glazed over um, because you're not interested in cars like I am, but there's a point I wanna, I wanna make to you and I, let me get to it. In most states, um, of the United States, most states, the vehicles are considered a classic after 15 years. There's considered a, an antique after 25 years. So think about this. The 1972 Corvette that my father had is 48 years old. 48 years old. It's almost an antique times two. And you know, to me, I think about that and it doesn't seem very long because I'm older than that, right? It doesn't, for most of us, it doesn't seem like it ought to be an antique, but think about this. If you find one of those vehicles and it's unrestored, it's a completely different story. Because this is what we know. Over time, pain begins to fade. The sun beats down on the leather seats and they begin to get cracked and dry. And the, uh, the, the engine parts, the gears, they begin to get dust and grime and dirt in them and they begin to rust and they begin to break down. You know, muscle cars like the, the Corvette are probably, and, and this car behind me, are probably um, some of the most popular vehicles that anybody ever restores. But that 1967 L88 Corvette that went for $3.8 million wasn't stored in a bubble for 40 years. It wasn't. Somebody had to take the time. Somebody had to put in a lot of effort. Somebody had to put in a lot of man hours and a lot of money to try to bring that vehicle back to its original glory. And I think sometimes we age similarly. I think we do that, no, not just physically, but when often we look back when we're at this particular stage that we're talking about today, this stage of adjustability, and, I, and we feel like our lives are more, they kind of more resemble an old, an old beat up, ignored car. And uh, coming off the assembly line, I think when we're, when we're young, right, we come off the assembly line, we have these big plans, these big life plans, and 
We seem to, seem to have them, they're grandiose and they're exciting. And then we sit here and we're 30, 40, 50 years later and some of us really don't have much to show for it except for a little dust and a little rust. But even, even though your Corvette image of life feels like it resembles something very different, I want you to hear this this morning. God is always there. He always has been, He always will be. And He's always been in the, in the business of restoring lives. Restoring lives that are worth way more to Him than any price tag that could be tagged on at an auction. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 is what we're going to be in. We're going to be reading 14 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. I'm going to read that right now for us. It's not a, not a lot. But I want to read that through, and it'll give you time to get there. I'm reading from the New Living Translation today, and um, that'll be a reference. It's not a, not a big big stretch from the NASB or whatever it is that you're reading. So I want to read that to us. This is 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. It says, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good thing work. Father, I just want to thank you today for your word. I want to thank you today for this passage of scripture that we're going to talk about. I pray as we dive into it, that it would be something that you will teach us more about ourselves and how we can be more like your son. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to listen, help us to learn and help us to be focused so that your Holy Spirit can speak to us in the way that it wants to today. We'll give you praise in Jesus name. Amen. Well, we are here, uh, as we stand here, we are in week four. We are in the fifth stage, but we're in week four. The first week we did two stages. Um, this, this series we're calling Stages Maximizing Your Potential in God's Kingdom. So the first week, let me catch you up a little bit in case you didn't see it. Only the way you can go back and watch all of these on hfcnaz.com or Facebook page or our YouTube channel. But we began with the adorability stage. The adorability stage being this infant and toddler stage where, where basically we're existing, um, we're existing to eat and we're existing to grow and learn. And we have everything bombarding our senses and we're, we're growing. And that's what this stage is all about. Then we also talked about that first Sunday. We talked about the accountability age. Somewhere between the age of, of 8 and 12. Where, uh, where we begin to understand what it means when, when, when Jesus... And God says He loves us and He sent His Son to die for us. And we begin to, to understand what that's all about. And we understand that we are sinners. And we understand that He's the only way. Okay, that's the accountability stage. And then we talked about the acknowledgeability stage. These are the teenage years on up to age 19. Where we begin to acknowledge the fact that there are truths in the world. There are things that we are going to make decisions to believe and not believe. And we are going to mold and form our our, our basic worldview. That's what the acknowledgeability stage of a teenager is about. And then last week we talked about the acceptability stage. This is your 20s. This is when we, we, we get off the ground and we begin to think about the career choices that we've made or we're going to make, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. And, uh, many, many people have families and they begin to have children and, and all of these things. That is the that is the acceptability stage when you're accepting responsibility for many, many more things. Today, we're going to talk about the adjustability stage. This is the mid to late 30s to 40s, the adjustability stage. Adjustability stage can be defined as when a, when a young adult finds himself just absolutely full of confidence and dreams and, and all kinds of energy, and they hit this point where they realize that they're in, their, they're in their mid to late 30s and they're in their early 40s and, and, and things have not turned out exactly like they thought they would. Maybe not like they, accept, they expected. Thus, the real need to adjust and to restore what might have been lost. 
comes into play. Whether you're maybe been a Christian for a lot of years, or maybe you haven't been a Christian for very long, maybe you're not a Christian at all, and you have feelings of regret, feelings of, of defeat, and uh, all these things come into play again in the adjustability stage. And in the adjustability stage, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've been, how many times, how long you've been a Christian, or if you're not a Christian, those feelings of regret and defeat, they don't play favorites. Maybe, see, you're not a Christian, so there's no doubt that you have made plans, you've made your own plans in life. And when those things don't happen, you rely on numero uno, you rely on, on yourself to try to figure it out. Believers, on the other hand, will find plenty of, of difficulty in this adjustability stage. If you haven't prepared yourself in the previous stage, um, with an active relationship with the Lord. You're going to find problems are going to rise up. So either you've gotten to this place where life feels broken down while you're on your own as an unbeliever, or you're a believer who just kind of let your relationship with the Lord slip away and begin to break down and begin to get a little rusty. In both cases, you can expect trouble with relationships, with self-esteem, and really with overall dissatisfaction with your life. So the midlife crisis uh, during this adjustability stage is a very, very common thing. Um, it's even something that we joke about sometimes, but the truth of the matter is, it's not really a joking matter in a lot of cases. See, notoriously, the people that have been tagged with, uh, with the midlife crisis, uh, it's been the men, right? It's a, it's a man thing. Um, but that is not completely true. Absolutely not true. You ask women who have gone through this and women who are experiencing this now. They have very much the same feelings of disappointment, the same feelings of regret, that their lives just didn't turn out the way they thought they would. And they find themselves in this stage. So you talk about, we've been talking about classics here, right? We're talking about classics. It reminds me of an old Eagles song, a classic Eagles song, You Can't Hide Your Lion Eyes. Because that song is all about a lady it's all about a woman who, is, who has made poor choices early on in her life. She's had a life that's been fixated on worldly gain, and she finds out over time that that's really hollow and that's really empty, so she heads off into the night for a younger man. See, men have, men have been tagged with this midlife crisis label largely due to the pressures of the job, so to speak. See, we certainly as Christians recognize that it's a father's role. It's a man's role to be the spiritual leader in his family. The pressure is also there for, for single moms. Very, very similar. But God calls us to that. And when God calls us to that, when we, we don't meet those expectations in our minds, then something happens and we tend to look for things. We look for things that make us feel better. We look for things that, that, that maybe will help us to just ignore it altogether. So that's why a man sometimes will, will go out and buy a hot rod or he'll go out and buy a boat um, or he'll have an affair. Thinking that that's, if he does those things, he's going to put his mind in a completely different place. Again, whether you're a Christian or a non-believer, whether you are a man or whether you are a woman, this stage can challenge us and it can challenge us to make adjustments to our lives. We have to adjust, and if we don't adjust, we're going to spend the rest of our life wondering what could have been, wondering what should have been. We have two problems I want to talk about today, two problems that can arise during the adjustability stage. Number one, when you see your life's reflection, it looks nothing like you thought it would. When you see your life's reflection, it looks nothing like you thought it would. Have you ever been there? You ever been in that place where things just haven't turned out like you hoped they would? Maybe, maybe you, you thought, well, I should have a nest egg right now. Right? I should have this retirement thing sitting there, but it's just, it's, it's in limbo. It's not happening. Maybe the dreams that you've had of becoming, becoming an artist or a, or a fireman or a teacher or a fisherman or president of the United States or anything, scratch that last one. I don't think, that, I don't think anybody needs to be a part of that right now. Nobody wants to be president right now. But perhaps you, you, you don't have the possessions that you thought you would. 
Maybe you're in a job where you wonder every single day, will I just stay in this no, this dead end job or will I ever find something that I enjoy? Maybe you find yourself at this stage and you're, and you're really struggling because you already have health risks. Maybe you've ruined some relationships. You're deep in debt. Maybe you have nothing to show over this 20 years of self-indulgence and poor decision making. Guys, these are all very, very common questions that arise during the adjustability stage. The second thing, the second problem that can arise during the adjustability stage is that it often leads to what I call the family fallout factor. See, reality, the reality check hits, and it hits at a point for lots of people at this place where, where they see the effect of the decisions that they have made as parents, and they begin to see the effects that they have decisions they have made on their own children. So you might, you might think of your kids right now and you might think, well, my, my children right now or my child right now is, is eternally lost. And you might equate that to the mistakes that you feel like you've made in raising them. Some of you have spent years, knowingly sometimes, running in the opposite direction of what you know God has called you to do, what His plan is for your life. And I think our children are much more observant than we sometimes think we ever give them credit for. Often, they see how we tackle life or how we don't tackle life. Sometimes they see that like, like our dreams as parents might have been replaced by fear of failure. So it never happened. And inevitably, some of our kids follow suit and their lives turn out the same way. See, kids... Kids don't spend the time, the time in the Word lots of times because they never saw you doing it. Or they don't, they don't see the sinfulness in bending the rules a little bit because you excused it in your own life. So these are, these are problems. These are problems that we find ourselves dealing with in the adjustability stage. Number one, when you see your life's reflection, it doesn't look any, it looks nothing like you thought it would. And number two, it often leads to this family fallout factor. So let's tackle these. Those are, those are very depressing words. Those are very sad things for me to say. But, but let's tackle them because there's a way, there's an answer. God always has an answer. We're going to tackle these two problems. First, when you see your life's reflection, it looks nothing like you thought it would. Let's look at our passage of Scripture today, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14-17. through 17. Let's look at those and kind of take them apart a little bit to help us to understand Verse 14 says, But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you must trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have, been, and they have given you wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to listen here for just a minute. We'll get to the other two in just a minute. This is where Paul is talking to Timothy, young Timothy, the young pastor, where the turmoil and, and, and persecution is going on all around Timothy. And Paul writes him a letter and he says to him, Timothy, you've got to stay the course. He says, you've got to continually fix the things before they begin to get rusty, before they begin to get broken. And you do that by relying on God's truth, by relying on God's word. Be faithful. I know some of you have probably grown up in church. Maybe you've walked away from church. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you never really took it serious in the first place. You never really had a relationship with Christ. Maybe, maybe you've left. Maybe you've just been a little bit too busy and you've never gotten back to it. Maybe you've been saved for years. You need to get back in church. Maybe somebody in the church really, really hurts you and you just don't want any part of it. I hear it all the time. But there's a foundation. There's a foundation of truth that you were taught by a Sunday school teacher or by a pastor. Maybe you were taught by, by Christian friends that you had in high school or friends that you had in college or a Bible study or, or a Thrive group, right? These, these people that were, that were healthy, living healthy Christian lives and influenced you. Paul would say to every single one of you today, he would say, recall those truths and restore your relationship with the Lord. It's like, it's like putting an old Camaro Right, restoration project. It's like putting this up on a lift so that you can see exactly what needs to be repaired. That's what Paul is telling Timothy to do. 
I want us to look at verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. There is, there's an incredibly important and power-filled word in verse 16 that I want to point out. It's this word inspired. In your version of the Bible, it might say inspiration. But either way, it is a, it is a compound Greek word. The first word is theos. This may be a Greek word that you didn't realize you knew. This, how many of you know that that means God? Theos means God. It's where we get, it's where we get our term theology. It's a study of God. Okay, theos means God. That's the first word. The second word is it comes from the word phineo. And this is what it means. Phineo means to, to blow or to breathe or to emit a fragrance. But this is the really cool part. Put these things together like Paul did. Paul puts these two words together and we get this word, theophnustos. And it just simply means God breathed. But it's not quite that simple because it, there's a deeper meaning when you add the two words together. And that's the really cool part. Putting these together, Paul, Paul puts them together and he gives an additional meaning. So it changes the picture entirely because it adds this. Life force. Energy. Power. Think about it like this. There's a Bible, Bible scholar and pastor and author, Rick Renner. This is what he says. He says, think about this as a, as a deflated balloon. He says, blow your breath into this balloon and that balloon will inflate to its, to its true form. And then you take it and you tie it off. You tie it off and your breath is held within that balloon. The breath that filled it up empowers it to keep its true form. See, your breath created its form and your breath sustains its form. He says this, he says, if the molecules inside the balloon were analyzed, it would be found that a part of me is inside, is held inside, in the form of the air I breathe into it. Paul's description of God's Word literally says that God's power was breathed into the words of the men who wrote them. That's incredible to me. And here's another really cool part. The breath of God in His Word is like a balloon that's been tied off. What do I mean? I mean because it is as powerful today as it was when it was first breathed by God into these men that wrote it. So now, now why is it that this God breathed, God breathed this powerful fragrance into the Bible? Why did God do that? If we read 16 and 17, it gives us the answer. Why? Because it is there to teach us what is true. It's there to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Man, I love that. So, so what about the second problem? What about the second problem? There's often the family fallout factor. When you're not, when you're, you, you believe that for some reason your life has set up a bad example. And that example may have impacted the lives of your own kids. When I, when I think about this, I immediately thought of the prodigal son. The, 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 par the parable of the prodigal son is found in Luke chapter 15. So think about for just a minute, the youngest son leaves home and he's, and he's thinking that he had all the answers that he ever needed in life, right? He has the, he has the life by the table. Have you ever stopped and never considered the father's thoughts? Have you ever thought about what the father must have been thinking in this parable? Because I guarantee you, as a dad myself, I guarantee you in the flesh, he was thinking, uh, I really second guessing himself. And he was thinking, where did I go wrong? What did I do? What did I, what did I not do to make my son do this? So the broader understanding of this parable would tell us that this adjustability stage just might be where this father was. So I want you to do something for me. I want you to place yourself in the prodigal son's nasty, smelly, worn out clothes that he had on after learning the hardest lesson of his life. 
And imagine yourself walking down the road towards your father's home. Because that's what he did. I imagine he had his head down. And I imagine he was down and, and sad and depressed. And he probably stopped a dozen times and thought, I need to turn around. This is ridiculous. He's not going to take me back. And he was nervous and he was scared about the response that his father might have. And ask yourself this question. What if, what if that was you? What if that was you? Take the imagery of your, of your own father, your own dad, running up the road towards you with that gigantic lump in his throat and tears streaming down his face. His father was the patriarch of the family. And in this day and time and in this culture, it would have definitely been considered undignified for him to even consider running anywhere. But the Bible tells us he couldn't get there fast enough. And I thought about that. And I thought about if this man is in this stage of his life, he thought about his son, he prayed for his son every single day. How much joy in his heart and how much of the smile on his face came from finally receiving the burden that he carried and relieve, excuse me, relieving the burden that he carried, believing that himself at least had partial responsibility in his son's life and what his son had decided to do. How many times he must have thought that? But when his son, that day many, many days before, when his son took off up that road, leaving, leaving home behind, leaving his, with his pockets full of cash and his, and his head full of false confidence, don't you think, don't you think that dad stopped and thought, wow, things really didn't turn out like I thought they would. But God's faithful. God is faithful. Listen to this. I want you to remember that when, when I said this to you, I said, I said that when you go through these things and you're having struggles here, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, man or woman, you can expect trouble with relationships, with self-esteem, and with your overall dissatisfaction with life. Okay, that's, that's a reality. And there are many of you today that are shaking your hands yes, and you're saying, yeah, that's a reality. I can testify to that. It's true. But the Bible and your faith in God if that was the driving force in the previous stage, then what you're finding right now is that it's a whole lot smoother transition. If you've prepared yourself, if you've done that, then you're finding that you don't, you're not dealing with some of these struggles that I'm talking about today. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do you hear those words? Put Him first. Seek Him first above all things, His righteousness. And when you do that, all of these things are going to be given to you. The stage of adjustment is about making change. It's about making change to better things. We've been talking since the beginning of 2020. We've been talking about this word, healthy. It's about getting healthy. That's what I'm talking about. As they, as they say, the first step in, in, the in the right direction is admitting that you need to head in a new direction. Don't make the mistake. I, I want to point this out to us real quick. Do not make the mistake of, of pinning your shortcomings on God. Don't do that. Don't say, well, God's been holding me back. God never made a way for me in all my dreams. Because this is something you need, you need to understand. His dreams may not be your dreams. Your dreams may be completely different. And, that, and that's something that you should recognize here in this adjustability stage if you're here. It's also something you should recognize if you missed it way back then. Never allow your shortcomings to turn into you measuring what you believe about God according to what you're experiencing in life. Let me say that again. Never allow your shortcomings to turn into you measuring what you believe about God according to what you're experiencing in life. Folks, you have to have faith. You have to pull yourself out of it. But that faith cannot be placed in yourself. It must be placed completely, 100% in God. This is what we know. The midlife, midlife is by no way, in no means the end. And I believe it's time for us to break out the bondo and the sandpaper, so to speak. So we've got, we need to smooth the rough edges. We need to, to knock out the dents and we need to buff the scratches of these past mistakes that we have in our lives. It's time for us 
to focus on real life renewal and do some radical restoration to your relationship with God. Looking forward, or excuse me, looking backward won't move you forward. But looking forward with the Lord, man, it, it can begin to show you all the possibilities, great possibilities that He has for you in the future. Listen to what Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says. It says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on the one, on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. No, is calling us. Is calling us. So let me ask you, are you, are you a Christian today and you find yourself in this adjustability stage? Right now, maybe this is where you are, or maybe it's passed you by. And you stand here years later with all these regrets and all these things that have never gone away. I want you to imagine something. Imagine what your life might look like in the next 30, 40, 50 years if you completely, totally, really commit your life to living it like God wants you to live it. The very, best, the very best vehicle restorers will tell you one thing. They'll tell you this. They'll say, the ve having, the, having the vehicle's lines have to be perfect. The vehicle's lines have to be straight. Perfect lines are everything. And I want to say this to you. Only God can restore life in a way that needs His perfect touch. Only He can do that. So I want to ask you right now, will you... Just between you and the Lord. Obviously, nobody can do this for you. Will you right now ask God to restore your soul? And ask Him to replace your dreams with His dreams for you. I want to stop and I want to, I want to pray for you right now. I'll pray with you right now. Let's pray this. Father, God, today I thank you for every person that is here. And Lord, for those that have been attentive and listened to the words from your past, from your past the scripture that we've read. And Listen to the Holy Spirit. God, right now, I pray. I pray that you would be very, very real. And I pray that they would listen and they would, they would begin to just realize that if they just lay everything in front of you, you will restore them to new. You're able to do that, God. You're the only one that's able to do that. So, Father, this morning, I pray and I ask that you would bless each and every person that is making a commitment this morning. Lord, would you wake them up in the morning and would you, would you, when they go to bed at night, would they not forget that you've called them to something new, you've called them to something better, you've called them to, to, to hone the edges, to beat out the, to beat out the bumps and the, and the dents and, and to smooth out the scratches. Lord, you, you're able to do that. So Lord, I pray for each and every person this morning that is praying this prayer, would you hear them? And would you answer their prayers and would you help them? to be everything that you've called them and you've planned for them to be. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And well, for the rest of us, maybe maybe for the rest of you, maybe today you would say, well, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a non-believer. I've never accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And maybe the adjustability stage is where you find yourself. Like I said, it doesn't matter who you are. You can find yourself in this place. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe that's where you are today. Possibly, you're also one of those that would say, that passed me up 10 years ago. And I'm still in this place, this funk that I need to get out of. But you find yourself with these frustrations and feeling like you've got some failures in your life. I've got some very good news for you today, folks. God's forgiveness and God's powerful breath that we talked about, His breath of peace and prosperity and possibility are for everybody. As in everybody. They're for everybody. And I want to ask you a very simple question. Is today the day? Today is the day that you need to ask Him into your life and say, Lord, would you restore my life? Make me brand new. If that's you today, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Those of you who are believers today, please, right now, go to fervent prayer. There are people that will watch this in days to come. But there are people that will be watching this and the Lord knows. The Lord, the Lord is not uh, messed up by time and space like we are. God hears your prayers and He will adapt those to any time, any place where someone is listening and His Holy Spirit is speaking to them. So be praying right now for those people that will make this decision. That the decision that they make 
will be real and long-lasting, everlasting. Pray with me right now if you'd like to pray this prayer. Father, I would admit to you, Lord, that I am a sinner. I would admit to you that I have done evil things. I haven't done anything in my life that, that matches up to what you tell me I should. Um, you tell us that we've all sinned. You tell us that we've all fallen short of your plan, your glory. And Lord, that's me today. I want to say that I admit to you, I am that guy. I'm that girl. I'm a sinner. And Lord, also today, I want to, want to say I admit that, but I also believe that you sent your son for me. I believe that you sent your son and he, and he died on this cross. And, and, and my sin and the sins of, of the past generations, the generation of now and the generations in the future, God, you laid all of those sins upon him, your own son, your only son. And he died on that cross in my place because that's what I deserved. I believe that you sent your son. I also believe that you sent your son and he died and he rose again just like he said three days later. And Lord, that resurrected life that he had, that resurrected life where he was on this earth for 33 years and then all of a sudden he was in heaven with you, Lord, that new life, I want that. Lord, I want a resurrected life. So Lord, would you please come? Would you be Lord of my life? Lord, I believe that you sent your son and I, I just commit my life to you. Lord. Be the Lord of my life. Teach me, walk with me, go with me. Show me the next step to take and the next step to take and the next step to take. And Lord, I believe you, I love you, and I, and I thank you for saving me this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, if you made that decision this morning, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your entire life, as I always say, in your entire eternity. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And we rejoice with you this morning in that. And um, I want to say this to you. If you're that person and, and you made any kind of decision today, whether you've accepted Christ as the first, for the first time or, or maybe you've come back or maybe you just said, you know, I, I really need to fix things. I really need to let the Lord restore my life again. If that's you this morning, then I want to ask you, would you just, would you post something? Would you put a, would you make a comment today? And just let us know. We want to rejoice with you. And I want to say this to you also. If you are in the, in the Huntington area, Huntington, West Virginia, we are on 30th and 3rd. Huntington First Church of Nazarene, that's where we are. We would love to have you. We would love to be a part of your life, helping you to, to grow in this relationship with, with God. This brand new thing. Guys, you can't leave it there. That's what the church is for. You need to come and you need to let us help you to be disciple you so that you can be everything God wants you to be. Now, if that's you today and you can't come because you live somewhere way out, I want to, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. Please go find a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where you can get, where you can grow, where you can get nurtured, and where you can do all these things to be the best disciple for Jesus Christ you can be. I hope that's you today. I'm so grateful. I'm thankful for every person that has come to be a part of this. Uh, today, I'm very thankful, and I want you to know that I love you as your pastor, and I miss you. I'm looking forward to June the 7th when we all finally get to come back together, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing a lot of your smiling faces. Really, really miss you. Hope you have a wonderful day in the Lord, and don't forget, go and be light in a dark world. Be blessed.